Well, th thank you again for uh, joining this afternoon. And uh, I'm going to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me for a minute. I'm going to go to uh, share screen now and head into the uh, PowerPoint so that we can, again, thanks for joining this afternoon. Well, this year, of course, everything is different. We're celebrating Iowa City Pride virtually and uh, this event uh, made possible by the Senior Center is uh, one I'm very, uh, very grateful to participate in. So uh, thank you both again, Sam and Emily for uh, inviting me today. I wanted to begin with a <clears throat> quotation from one of my, uh, one of my heroes. Uh, this is James Baldwin a very noted American author who uh, <clears throat> was also uh, a very uh, astute observer of the American uh, political and social landscape, especially with regard to race and with regard to sexual orientation. James Baldwin was openly gay at a time when it was extremely difficult to be visibly gay uh, in 1956. His novel, Giovanni's Room, uh, shook up the literary world a bit, and it was really considered a, 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 a literary breakthrough in terms of frank discussion of homosexuality. But I wanted to open with James Baldwin with a quotation that I've always, um, not always, but since I've known of it for several years now, have uh, liked to lean on as a, as a way to set the stage for what history means to us, no matter what the topic is. James Baldwin once said that <clears throat> American history is longer, larger, more various, more beautiful, and <clears throat> more terrible than anything anyone has ever said about it. I think that uh, summarizes the uh, complexities and also, frankly, the uh, the the uh, very uh, challenging periods in history that uh, segments of our population face. Indeed, it did not start with Stonewall. Uh, those of you who are familiar with Stonewall will know that it was uh, an uprising that occurred 51 years ago this week in New York, in Greenwich Village, Stonewall was a bar that had been, like many gay bars at the time, routinely invaded or uh, raided by police. Uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, community repression represented that uh, in the uh, Stonewall uprising, uh, essentially those who spontaneously responded that evening said, enough is enough. and. This did not happen in a vacuum. There was a lot that built up to that time. In uh, 1965, for example, one of the uh, earlier public demonstrations in support of, of uh, equality for homosexuals was in front of the State Department because of its uh, uh, decade-long practice at that point of dismissing employees on the basis of their sexual orientation. And in the summer of 1965, uh, about uh, 40 uh, individuals picketed in front of the State Department in Washington to protest this uh, discriminatory practice. This dates back to 1953. And uh, I can't give you the attribution of this uh, headline, but it is very typical of the time. And it is said that um, more homosexuals were ousted from the federal government than known communists or suspected communists. When we hear of the uh, 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 blacklisting of, of um, members of the uh, Communist uh, Party of America in the early 19, late 1940s, early 1950s, not as much is known about those uh, who either uh, were suspected of being homosexual or who actually did self-identify as such. And <clears throat> this is, uh, again, another part of the uh, hidden history of uh, how homosexuals in the United States have been uh, 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 treated uh, over time. And indeed, this traces back to 1953 uh, in, in terms of legal uh, 
enforcement with Executive Order 10450. Uh, it was signed into or, uh, signed into law by President Dwight Eisenhower in 1953, and it read, <clears throat> "Any criminal, infamous." dishonest, immoral, or notoriously disgraceful conduct, habitual use of intoxicants to excess, drug addiction, or sexual perversion. And this was codified for, um, I'm not quite certain how long the executive order itself remained in place, but certainly for, uh, for decades following 1953. So this was a climate that uh, students at the University of Iowa were in. In 1951, this front page story in the Daily Iowan, I think, typifies the, uh, uh, the, the, the climate that uh, gay students and faculty were facing. Robert Shelley was a graduate student in the uh, Iowa Writers Workshop. And he was also uh, tabbed to be an editor of uh, uh, of a regional literary publication based here in Iowa City. And the pressure, at least ostensibly at the time, from the editorship responsibilities were uh, overwhelming for him, but also the fact that he was a gay man in a straight world in 1951. This uh, very sad episode is recounted in much more detail in David Dowling's book, which came out last year. If you're not familiar with it, I recommend it highly. It's entitled A Delicate Aggression. And it's a history of uh, the, the many personalities that have intersected at the Iowa Writers Workshop since its uh, formation back in the 1930s. Uh, David Dowling's book came out last year. It's published by uh, Yale University Press. And uh, I recommend it highly. He devotes a chapter to this uh, uh, particular incident. We are at the mercy of the law. And Iowa, very typically, uh, like most states, had enforcements in place in terms of statutes that were uh, considered uh, 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 regulatory in terms of private conduct and very, very repressive. I went to the uh, law library one day, uh, about a year ago, and I went into the Code of Iowa to see what the law said about uh, homosexuality. And you, in, in working with indexes from a particular period of time, you need to think in terms of the vocabulary used at the time. There was no entry, of course, in the uh, 1915 Iowa Code for uh, LGBT. The word gay had not been uh, used in, in, uh, in, in wide uh, uh, application yet. And also <clears throat> even uh, the, the clinical term of homosexuality was considered uh, a source of uh, discomfort uh, in, in legal documents at times. And so we, uh, we looked to the, the term that was used at the time and with a bit of creativity, we find that the term at that point was sexual perverts. That's the index term. And picking it out, we look under that category and we find offenses against chastity, morality, and decency. And here's the penalty. And this was essentially the law up until 1978. In Iowa and in most states, the, there, there were similar laws. In Iowa, any person who shall commit sodomy shall be imprisoned in the penitentiary not more than 10 years, nor less than one year. You could be imprisoned for being discovered or for uh, perhaps even being suspected. And this uh, in, in milder forms might have come in the form of being fired from your job, losing your home, being evicted if you were a renter, uh, even if you did own a home, perhaps uh, the bank could foreclose on your, on your mortgage uh, and force you out. There were any of a number of other uh, uh, legally accepted ways to essentially marginalize and, and separate out this entire community. But by the mid 1960s, the uh, openness on campus began to appear. This is a, a clipping from 
uh, Daily Iowan in uh, 1968. And it's a notice in the uh, Daily University Bulletin Board that reads, the psychopathic hospital, as it was known at the time, is developing a treatment program for male homosexuals and young men with homosexual preoccupations. And the notice further reads, young men who desire further information should write for an appointment time all information will be in strict confidence. It's not at all clear what is meant by treatment. Uh, it very well could be a, a form of conversion therapy that was in, in practice at the time, or perhaps this was a clinical trial. Uh, we know now that conversion therapy never works and it has uh, no real uh, standing today in uh, social work or uh, professional psychological uh, communities. But this notice was not unusual at the time. And uh, as I said, I don't know how we might interpret the word treatment, but it was uh, regarded as a, uh, uh, as a clinical uh, phenomenon. In uh, 1965, and I believe this is the earliest uh, news item I could find in the Daily Iowan in which uh, homosexuality is addressed in a way that is not uh, considered clinical or dismissive or, or scandalous. A uh, woman representing the uh, Chicago chapter of uh, an early uh, homosexual rights group, the Daughters of Belitis, uh, was invited to speak on campus and she spoke to the uh, uh, engineering faculty club at the Iowa Memorial Union. This was in 1965, and uh, this is uh, an account that appears in, in the uh, Daily Iowan. Bars are a very important framework of socializing for gays who don't have any other uh, known outlet. And at, that, uh, at, at, at a time prior to Stonewall and even for uh, years following, word of mouth was often the only way that uh, information about uh, uh, socializing locations could be uh, 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 could be learned. Uh, of course, no social media, uh, very strong injunctions against people for being public about their sexual orientation. This ad appeared in a 1967 issue of the uh, Daily Iowan. Kenny's was not uh, a, a gay bar as such, but it was uh, in a number of circles apparently considered a, a, a gay friendly bar. It was uh, at least tolerant and tolerance was about the best that many uh, gay men and lesbians could, uh, could expect at that time. Uh, those of you who uh, were in Iowa City prior to uh, about 1980 may recognize this block. This is the uh, uh, first block of South Clinton Street below the Pentecrest, and we're looking northwest from, uh, from college. Uh, the old Capitol is behind these uh, buildings, which uh, were raised uh, around 1978 for construction of the uh, old Capitol Town Center. But Kenny's was located on this block and uh, uh, as I said, was a, a very popular uh, uh, hangout in general and was uh, by code uh, considered a, a, a socially tolerating place for gays. If you were to peruse her books, you'll find uh, a number of images through the years. This is a uh, gender bending party from 1942. This appeared in the Hawkeye Annual and it is uh, uh, an image I offer without comment. There isn't much context with this, except that it was uh, a fraternity sorority uh, mixer just off campus and uh, uh, probably uh, a Sadie Hawkins type uh, event in uh, the early 1940s. The uh, uh, alumni of uh, the University of Iowa uh, uh, comprise a pretty long list and this particular individual who uh, appeared on stage in a 1938 production of Henry IV uh, in uh, what is today the maybe theater is um, young man by the name of Thomas Williams. And he uh, was a student at Iowa for, uh, I believe, four semesters. He and the theater director, E.C. Maybe, did uh, not get along. And it's clear that there was uh, evidence of homophobia on the part of the uh, 
theater department director's part. Um, Thomas Williams became better known later as Tennessee Williams. He uh, actually completed his degree at the University of, Minnes uh, of, uh, University of Missouri, um, having uh, uh, a very difficult experience here in Iowa City as a graduate student. Not so much socially because he uh, recalled coming out in Iowa City and he thought that uh, at that time it was a very uh, congenial atmosphere, but because of his uh, relationship with faculty. Grant Wood, uh, a member of the uh, School of Art and Art History faculty, had a very uh, vituperative relationship with Lester Longman, who was director of the school during uh, Grant Wood's last um, four years or so on the faculty. Wood died at age 51 uh, in 1942, and it's believed that uh, part of his, uh, uh, par part of the uh, fact, well, one of the factors perhaps contributing to his early death was the uh, stress that he experienced while on the faculty uh, at Iowa. Longman, uh, there, there is evidence, had uh, uh, a very, uh, uh, had a very homophobic attitude and was attempting to, uh, uh, oust Wood from the faculty because, uh, at least ostensibly, the uh, uh, vision that Wood had of offering a, an apprentice-based program did not square with Longman's very different view of what he wanted the school to offer, and that would be a, uh, an academic program that incorporated art criticism, art history, and other uh, sub-disciplines. And so the two were at uh, uh, loggerheads for uh, for several years, and it uh, became uh, a very very tense situation, uh, which is uh, well documented in Trip Evans' book, uh, uh, Trip Evans' biography of Grant Wood, uh, also very uh, highly recommended. It's the 50 year anniversary of Pride here in Iowa City. The first known uh, public event that occurred in Iowa City was on homecoming in October of 1970. And this image appears in the 1971 Hawkeye yearbook. Uh, the, the float is of uh, several members of the uh, fledgling Gay Liberation Front, which was established at uh, the University of Iowa that fall. It was the first Gay, gay student organization in the United States to be officially recognized by a university. Uh, in this case, Gay Liberation Front received some uh, programming funds from the uh, University of Iowa student government. And the uh, administration by that time, uh, led by uh, President Sandy Boyd, uh, was also supportive in uh, what turned out to be a rather quiet but, uh, uh, but important way. Uh, if you look closely at this image to the uh, left, uh, just uh, in the passenger seat next to the driver, uh, an African-American man who is holding a rifle, and he, he uh, according to uh, one of the participants I interviewed for our oral history collection, said that the, the, this man got uh, into the car at the last minute and said he uh, uh, was representing a chapter of the Black Panthers and was there in solidarity and as a means of protection. Remember that it was, e even in a, a nice uh, quote unquote liberal college town like Iowa City, uh, it took an incredible amount of courage to come out in a very public event like this in 1970. And I wish I knew more about that aspect of this particular act because it to me demonstrates uh, uh, an experience of intersectionality that occurred uh, between the very visible uh, actions at that time in the uh, post-civil rights uh, period and also the uh, newly uh, emerging uh, gay liberation movement. And that fall, there are, uh, you'll find in the Daily Iowan online archive, a number of articles published. There was a, a four-part series published in the DI uh, um, de de describing the experiences of gay people coming out for the first time. And uh, this is believed to be one of the uh, first uh, articles addressing Gay Liberation Front and its impact on campus in the fall of 1970. 
gay dances, uh, social activities, uh, social events were really the uh, first uh, uh, activity sponsored by Gay Liberation Front. It was political, but, uh, but also social. The fact that there were very few social frameworks for gay people to become involved with outside of the bars. And so the idea of uh, a gay social was truly uh, not only an experience, but also an experiment. The uh, basement of the uh, Unitarian Church uh, on Gilbert and uh, um, Iowa Avenue, uh, that building remains today. That the uh, basement was the scene of many of these socials, at least in the early years. I want to give a shout out to the Iowa Women's Archives. They have a number of resources pertaining to uh, the history of lesbian communities in Iowa, including records of the uh, uh, women's press uh, organizations that have formed in Iowa City over the years, one of which published a, a nationally distributed publication called Ain't I a Woman, which premiered in 1970, the same year of the first uh, uh, gay pride celebration in Iowa City. A little bit later, uh, in the 1980s, the uh, Quarterly journal Common Lives, Lesbian Lives was established in Iowa City. It eventually moved to, uh, I think, Santa Barbara, California. I'm not sure uh, if it went to UCSB or another one of the UC campuses. But Common Lives, Lesbian Lives was uh, uh, essentially, uh, if not a referee journal, it was certainly peer reviewed and it was. Uh, uh, a quarterly published by a uh, local women's press cooperative uh, here in Iowa City. The papers of Tess Catalano in the Iowa Women's Archives reveal a lot of uh, activism during the 1980s uh, and late 1970s. The first uh, Take Back the Night rally was organized uh, by Tess Catalano and uh, other activists in 1979 and uh, her papers include documentation of that, uh, of that period. This is the uh, third, uh, third or fourth uh, uh, year, 1982, of the uh, Take Back the Night March. Uh, again, it's from the uh, Tess Catalano papers. 1982 was not the first year that uh, Gay Movement course was offered, but it was uh, an early example of uh, curricular uh, restructuring to uh, address uh, this as an emerging academic discipline. Uh, today, Gay Studies is incorporated into a, a portion of the uh, program that we nicknamed GLIS, Gender, Women's Studies, and Sexuality. And uh, the roots can be traced back to about uh, uh, 1979, when the uh, first uh, uh, gay movement course was uh, offered. The University of Iowa is a pioneer in extending rights to uh, same-sex partners long before the uh, Iowa State Supreme Court decision of, night of uh, 2009, the University of Iowa in 1993 recognized same-sex partners as eligible for the same uh, domestic, uh, for, the, for the same uh, health care and other benefits extended to married heterosexual couples. And so in 1993, the uh, University of Iowa uh, became uh, the first uh, public institution and possibly the first uh, university uh, overall to extend uh, benefits. Uh, and this became effective on January 1st, 1993. Uh, what's interesting about this is the university made clear that it would not extend benefits to unmarried heterosexual partners because by the uh, university's reasoning at that time, uh, heterosexual couples had the legal option to marry uh, Same-sex couples, homosexual couples did not. And so uh, in, in the context of 1992, when the terms of these uh, benefits were being drawn up, uh, that, was the, uh, uh, that was the rationale for making this a, a very specifically aimed uh, program. AIDS, of course, devastated uh, the, the gay male population in the 1980s. And we have records from both the Gay People's Union, uh, which was 
one of the uh, successor organizations of Gay Liberation Front, uh, and also from uh, an independent group known at the time as the Johnson County AIDS Coalition. These two organizations tried to fill a void where it was believed that the university did not provide adequate support for people with AIDS or people uh, at risk of contracting AIDS. Student health services at the time was said to be very resistant to distributing education, distributing condoms, uh, just generally being a partner in, in the uh, 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 campaign to uh, curtail and, and uh, stop AIDS, but also to care for people who uh, in Johnson County who had been diagnosed. Um, whether fairly or not, and I don't want to uh, uh, go into whether the uh, criticisms were uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, fully uh, uh, justifiable or not, I was not here at the time, but the impression I get from, had gotten from at least two individuals at that time that I interviewed for our oral history collection, uh, the uh, university response at that time in their view was, was quite slow. And uh, that applied to the uh, state of Iowa as well. It was often left to these grassroots organizations such as GPU to take the initiative in in attending to the needs of local people who, who needed that support. I mentioned Gay Liberation Front and over the years it has evolved in name changes and beginning with GLF in 1970, throughout the 1980s, the, the name evolved in order to become more inclusive of its uh, mission and its scope. Gay People's Union was the organization's name for uh, a good portion of the 1980s and later became GALA, the Gay Lesbian Association. <clears throat> uh, more recently, I think after 2000, it was known as GLIBTAL, the Gay, Liber uh, the, the gay Lesbian, Bisexual, Trans, and Allies uh, Union. And now, uh, today, uh, I think since 2017, what was once known as Gay Liberation Front is now known as Spectrum. And we have records of the organization in its uh, various forms up to uh, about 2005 with uh, some, uh, some gaps in between. Uh, we do have more, uh, some more recent materials that uh, have come in but have not yet been uh, processed or cataloged. I'm going to close once again with James Baldwin. History is not a procession of illustrious people. It's about what happens to a people. Millions of anonymous people is what history is about. I think this is true, especially for marginalized, for historically marginalized groups in which we discover, we learn more about the experiences of those people and we attempt to document those experiences uh, in archives, in uh, historical research, in uh, other places of, uh, uh, of reference for, uh, people who, uh, for, for people who yearn for that knowledge. Please feel free to contact either uh, Karen or me. Karen is my colleague at the Iowa Women's Archives and her uh, email address is on the screen. Mine is david-mccartney at uiowa.edu. And if you want to learn more about our holdings, you can simply Google our uh, respective repositories, University of Iowa Archives or the uh, Iowa Women's Archives. And uh, finally, I wanted to mention to you that we do have an online exhibit that recounts highlights of LGBTQ life in Iowa City beginning in 1967. Uh, this is an, uh, <clears throat> an online exhibit that Karin and I co-curated uh, several years ago, not too long after the Iowa State Supreme Court decision on marriage equality. And you can, uh, I'll leave this up for a moment, or actually I might, uh, well, let's see if I can, I'm not gonna be able to copy it into the chat room, but uh, I will uh, <clears throat> leave that up for a couple of minutes so you can copy it down if you would like. Another way to find it is to simply Google LGBTQ life in Iowa City, and it'll take you, I think one of the first two or three hits will uh, take you to the homepage for that, uh, for that exhibit. 